Hello, I'm Stan Stoniker with Hub Culture, and we're here in Bermuda at the Bermuda Innovation Sprint, a new project that we're doing here to bring together leaders from fintech, AI, blockchain, and other industries to push Bermuda forward as a kind of laboratory. Joining me now is Jeb Linton, who's the Chief Technology Officer at IBM Cloud and IBM Cognitive Security. That's a very long title, but what you're really doing is AI, is that right? Uh, that's a big piece of what I do, yeah. It's, uh, it's a huge area for us, um, and just a very exciting area. AI uh, is, um, uh, it's, it's a major area of, uh, of, of interest for our customers. It's a big area that we're doing basic research in. Um, and I, I sort of sit at the, uh, the intersection of AI and security. Wow, so this is a big area because AI has become really a center point for many companies in terms of long-term strategy. And then there's also these kind of social implications of an AI that, or AIs that are rapidly improving. So let's talk about how do you see this happening? Like IBM Watson, certainly when I think of AI and IBM, I think of Watson. How does that yeah, fit in? Yeah, a Watson is really one of the uh, sort of the biggest areas that we've invested in over the last few years. Um, I was involved fairly early on. You've probably heard about the Jeopardy game. Mm -hmm. um, Very famous. 2010? Uh, 2010, I think it was late 2010. Um, and I was involved mostly through 2011 um, and then came back in to be the, their head of security for a while. Um, yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a big uh, initiative. It, it actually started in a, in a funny way, sort of uh, several guys around at a bar. Um, they had been involved in um, the, uh, the Deep Blue uh, project some years before that uh, taught a, uh, a, an AI to play chess and beat the grandmasters at chess. Um, the funny thing about it was this was a so-called grand challenge, but it, and it was a great, great step forward for AI, mm -hmm. but it really didn't have any commercial application. Um, so they were kind of smarting from that a bit. Um, and they, they were sitting around in a bar talking about potential grand challenges and they saw a, the Jeopardy playing on the TV um, and uh, they thought, hey, wait a second, if we could teach a question answering system to actually play Jeopardy, that would really push natural language processing technology forward in a way that would be really applicable to a lot of areas of business. So that's kind of how that whole thing got So started. going out for a beer does play benefits because now yes. you look at like the, the downstream and you have Apple's Siri and you have Alexa and you have all these like kind of augmented interfaces that are using AI to, to teach us. Where do you see this going? Like what are the kind of implications? There's a lot of perhaps uh, anxiety, I think, about about the growth of AI and also excitement sure. about this thing. I know you were speaking during the sprint about augmentation or aug augmented assistance versus autonomy. And True. let's talk about the line between those two things and where that, yeah, where that has the, risks. Well, the state of AI today, a lot of people, including IBM, like to say AI today is mostly about augmented intelligence rather than artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. in the sense that it's really about helping humans make decisions. And in, in general, for practically every AI system out there, uh, these are they're mostly decision support systems, systems that help people make decisions, not make decisions for them. Right. But as I've said, over time, what we can sort of see if we look in the you know, years long outlook, there's probably gonna be increasing pressure to do more autonomy. Um, one obvious example is autonomous cars. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is something that is in the press very much lately. Um, the way I like to think about it is, um, well, I'm sort of a security guy, and if you, if, you, uh, if you think about security, you have to think about it almost kind of like an economist, think about people's incentives. Um, the incentive today is to help people make decisions, but in a few years, perhaps, you know, varying depending on the field, there will probably be an increasing incentive to take people out of the loop because in field by field, like in the case of autonomous driving vehicles, um, there will at some point be a sort of a crossover point where it's more efficient, more effective to have a computer making the decisions rather than human. Mm -hmm. um, for example, you talk to like, uh, you know, certain companies like Airbus, they, they in some senses have um, more confidence in the machine's ability to make decisions in crisis situations than in the pilots. Um, the same will probably become true over time in autonomous vehicles. Uh, it, uh, th there's a huge part of the, the U.S. economy that depend on drivers, and so there's, 
uh, there's a sort of an ethical conundrum about uh, you know what happens when it becomes much more economically efficient for fully autonomous vehicles uh, to be employed by uh, by trucking companies, for example, than than you know people doing the driving. I think you know Bermuda here, where we are, is a major center for insurance and reinsurance. It's the third largest market, and one of the things that we've heard from executives here is that as you move into these AI-related systems, it actually will become very difficult to insure a situation that isn't like that. So yeah. it, it, it's actually forcing the entire industries, not just from a cost benefit analysis, but literally from an insurance analysis as well, to say, hey, like the, the risk is 40% higher if you have, say, human intervention versus ma machine control, then the market will price toward that. Yeah. So what are the implications of that for um, us humans? You know, I, I've heard people say that the best outcome for us is that we end up as pets, <laughs> um, I think which I think is a little, like yeah. a little, a little, like, you know, we're not used to being pets, right? No, no. Well, the, this is, of course, hopefully, very long-term outlook, but a lot of people these days are uh, thinking about the long-term prospects of AI. What happens if and when we have what's called an artificial general intelligence? Not Today we have these so-called narrow AIs. Uh, they're very task-focused, very specific to a particular use case, but there are a lot of researchers working on artificial general intelligence or a strong AI, something that is something that can think more generally almost like a human and a lot of people and also that once it learns it never forgets right yeah generally speaking yeah unless um, it's like a snapchat ai <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, but can you i mean people talk about this idea of like an exponential curve on an ai once you have an intelligent machine it can't become more intelligent than us um, there have been some interesting indications recently that it's possible for an ai to to learn and become more sophisticated very rapidly uh, I like to talk sometimes about the, the uh, AlphaGo uh, mm -hmm. experiment that some folks at Google did. Um, in, uh, you know, over the course of some months, they created a system that could play Go better than uh, a human grandmaster. But the really interesting thing that most people don't know about is that shortly after that, they created a different AI using something called a, a I believe it's a generative adversarial network, which is uh, basically two deep neural nets competing against each other and in the matter of just a few days without any record of uh, human grandmaster games like the previous uh, system had been trained on without any examples from humans these two uh, th this this adversarial network learned to play go better than the AlphaGo system without you know any input from humans essentially uh, and because it happened in just a very few days a lot of people in the AI research community thought, hey, hang on, this, this is a little bit scary because we have all been sort of assuming that when we have uh, a, an artificial general intelligence, we'll probably have you know, at least a decade or even a few decades to watch it gradually get smarter. But the fact that this thing learned to be better than the human grandmasters in just such a sh very short amount of time suddenly lent a lot of credence to the idea that it could happen very quickly. So we need to be nice to Siri is the bottom line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I don't think there's much danger of Siri or Alexa or Watson suddenly, uh, you know, uh, becoming uh, super intelligent. Uh, but uh, there are systems being experimented with in research labs that are intended to be more general types of intelligence. And we've got a while, I think. But yeah. We don't know how long. Well, I mean, that's amazing. And then when you start to think about the geopolitical considerations, mm -hmm. autonomous weapons, there's so many areas yes. that we could get into. Um, I think we'll leave it at that uh, for the moment. Thank you so much, Jeb, for joining us. Happy to be here. I'm Stan Stoniker with Hub Culture here in Bermuda. You can find more content at hublive.tv as well as find out about the next Bermuda Sprint at bermudasprint.com.